Thank you. And I'm curious, because I'm going to give away some of the plot of Atlas Shrugged. So I'm curious, how many of you have read Atlas Shrugged? All right, so I, I, I don't know what to do about that, because uh, um, I'm, giving, I'm going to give away key, crucial plot elements, because that's the topic I was asked to talk about. So it's his fault, not mine. <laughs> um, Atlas Shrugged creates a world in which one individual is taken on the responsibility of basically bringing it down in order to rebuild it. And to do this, he recognizes that the world is really held up by those in society that are the thinkers, the doers, the creators, the producers. And in the, the impact of them leaving, not just their association with the authorities, not just their association with the government, but leaving completely, utterly, withdrawing their sanction not just from the committees, but withdrawing their sanction from the society as a whole leaving society to struggle without them. A much, I think, bigger strike, if you will, a much bigger shrugging uh, than, than just not dealing with their authorities. Of course, in the novel, they have some way to go. That always helps. It would be nice if there was a gold gulch somewhere where, where some of us could actually go. It used to be Hong Kong. It used to be Hong Kong. That is true. And and in my case, right now, I, I you know I've I recently moved to Puerto Rico, um, and uh, they're trying to create a little bit of that in Puerto Rico. We'll, we'll see how well it succeeds. But uh, at least it's, they've got the tax rate right. Other than that, I don't think they have anything right. But they've got the tax rate right. <laughs> but that was enough to motivate me to uh, to shrug and to move away from the U.S. or so the mainland U.S. and to Puerto Rico. Um, but in the novel, and this is, this is I caution everybody um, to, to, to remember that it is a novel. In the novel, there is some way to go to. There is a plan. The plan is to bring down society as it is. The plan is to destroy. And then to rebuild. And there are key individuals, the key thinkers, producers in the culture, that are convinced to shrug, to go on strike, to leave, in order for this plan to work and go through. Unfortunately, we don't have anywhere to go. There's no plan. And indeed, the world, it turns out, is more complex than a few people who carry the world on their shoulders. And convincing the people who do carry the world on their shoulders to shrug would be very difficult. So. We might leave for personal reasons, and I'll get to that. Uh, it's not going to bring down the world, not in the sense. This has to. This has to do with me because last night I had the same thing. Last night, Microphone just stopped working. Do you need it? You probably don't. I don't need the microphone. I mean, maybe for the video. No, my. I have a big voice. So, whatever we think about this idea of struggling and going on strike. And I think it's an important idea because I think, I think you touched upon it when you talked about the idea of sanctioning. And sanction is a big deal. The sanction you give people is important. And it's important to your own self-esteem and your own life more than anything else. But I think we need to distance ourselves a little bit from the particulars of the novel in this case. Because Again, there's no big plan, there's no big agenda to be reached. It really is an issue of what we want to do as, as, as individual human beings. The world, like the world in Atlas Shrugged, is going in the wrong direction. I mean, one of the things that saddens me, and I, I, I spoke about this on my podcast last night, which I did from my hotel room, um, is that every time I come to Hong Kong, you guys are more pessimistic. <laughs> Every time I come to Hong Kong, things seem to be worse. I've been coming here, I think, it's the first time 
was uh, 2005, so it's been the last 14 years. Every few years I come and things are, uh, you know, there was a little hope, I think, in 2005. Maybe you would indeed take over China, not the other way around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, that seems really funny. <laughs> Every time I come, things are getting worse. Um, and I live in the United States, and every five years, looking back, things are getting worse. And if you're in Europe right now, and I travel a lot to Europe, and I spend a lot of time in Europe, again, there was this sense in the 1990s as the Berlin Wall came down, this real sense of optimism, that this sense that, you know, freedom was going to reign, that, that we were moving towards a new era, you know, I didn't quite buy the idea of the end of history, but I bought a lot of sentiment that, that you know, these, uh, we had the right ideas, and the right ideas were actually going to impact the world in a positive direction, and things are going to move in the right direction. And, and here was the Soviet Union communism disappearing, pow! You know, hundreds of millions of people are, 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 are freed. And now you go to Europe and everybody looks like you guys do. I mean, <laughs> every few years they, they, they seem to think things are worse. Things are going in the wrong direction. Uh, I was at an event a few years ago commemorating, was it the 25th anniversary, I think, of the, of the, of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I was with uh, Vaclav Klaus, the former president of uh, the Czech Republic, who was fought the communists and, and was part of it. I was with a woman who lived in East Germany and and who, uh, who uh, uh, was tortured by the secret police and now is a member of parliament in the German parliament. And, uh, and they spoke, and it was, this is to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, and it was really depressing. Because all they could talk about was how awful Europe is today and how awful the direction that Europe is heading in is today. And that in many ways they can see a future worse than where they came from. I, I remember the organizer came up to me, I was the last speaker, and he said, Your Honor, this is a celebration. <laughs> Please, you know, <laughs> say something positive. <laughs> I did my best, and I got, you know. Um, but the world is going in a negative direction, and, and maybe the last few years in the United States have illustrated this more than anything. We're reverting backwards to. Um, to a tribalism, to a collectivism, to, uh, to a, 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 uh, a rejection of the individualism, the freedom, the idea of, of the individual's ability to prosper, the individual's, the, the necessity of leaving individuals free to live their lives as they see fit. We're, we're, we're joining little groups, tribal groups, and fighting one another for what? over, over uh, emotion, not reason. We're banding reason in mass. In the United States right now, the uh, United States is, 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 the rhetoric is all about fear, it's all about emotion, it's all about a negation of basic economics. Uh, if, you look at the, if you look at the trade war, and uh, I'd be happy to talk about the trade war if, if you guys have questions, but it's a scary time. And you know, when I, somebody asked me, uh, somebody asked me once, Yuan, what's the most frustrating part of your job? And so the most frustrating part of my job, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, this will sound pretentious, and maybe it is, but the most frustrating part of the job is, I have the answers. We have the answers. I know how to fix the problems of the world. I think we really do, not just me, but a bunch of us know how to fix the problems of the world. They're not that hard. It's not a mystery why Hong Kong is so rich. Certain principles lead to certain outcomes. And it's not an accident if Venezuela is so poor and people are starving in the streets. Certain ideas, certain actions lead to certain consequences. Always, everywhere they try, no matter the ethnic group, no matter the geography, no matter where you are, they always happen that way. We have the answers. And what's frustrating about the job is nobody gives a damn. Nobody is listening. Nobody seems to be paying attention, except in Brazil. I'll talk about Brazil afterwards. But um, pretty much country after country, continent after continent, things are going in the wrong direction with very little, 
with very little, you know, uh, uh, backlash. Nobody seems to really care. I mean, the, 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 the conflict in the United States is between the collectivists of the right and the collectivists of the left. But they're all collectivists who want to impose their will on us individuals. They all want to manage our life in one way or another. They all want a central plan in one way or the other. I mean, I, I, I know there are a lot of Brits here. I mean, there was some optimism on Brexit. Brexit seemed like, you know, a good idea maybe, right? And, and I remember commenting on Brexit at the time. I said, Brexit is a beautiful thing if the Brits do the right thing once they exit. But the probability of the Brits doing the right thing once they leave Europe is very close to zero. <laughs> because nobody believes in the right thing anymore. The right thing being turn the UK into a free trade bastion, you know, a, a, a capitalist economy, uh, you, could, you know, have free trade with the rest of the world, including with Europe. And you can do that, by the way, with a hard Brexit. You could just leave, lower tariffs to zero, tell people they're welcome, and you could leave the European Union tomorrow. You don't need a deal. But of course, that is the one thing that's off the table, is the no deal Brexit. Not completely. What's that? Not completely. It's not completely off the it's table? More, it's, more, it's more back on the table than it was. Whoa. Whoa. Two, <laughs> we I hope so. I hope so. Yeah, but you know, maybe, maybe it's going to take uh, Boris Johnson to... realise the, the, the main barrier to it was the Northern Irish... Uh, and the well, of course. Yeah, I mean, that's not the main barrier. It is a barrier. Uh, it's a major barrier. Yeah. But, yeah. And, and it's complex, yeah. right? But well, they, it shouldn't be complex. Of course, if you have zero tariffs between Northern Ireland and Southern and Ireland, and why, do, why does Britain still control Northern Ireland? But we will stop there. Um, because they want to be part of Britain. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I, I, you know, and, and since when do we care what people want? Um, <clears throat> But the point is that even if they do do a hard Brexit, will they lower tariffs to zero? No. Will they actually institute free, market, free markets and, and lower regulatory barriers? No. They will actually take the regulations that they fought against at the European Union and impose them on the Brits. But, it, but everybody will say it's fine because their own government imposed it on them except the foreign government over there across the channel imposed it on them. But nothing will change in terms of the regulatory regime in the UK. Now, I, maybe there's more possibility of change. I'm not against Brexit. I just think the probability of something good coming of it is very low. My friends who are pro-Brexit tell me that the probability of something coming out of the European Union is basically zero. So a little bit above zero is better than zero. So what the hell, let's do Brexit. And I'm sympathetic. But that's a sad state of affairs. If, if we're debating between zero and a little bit above zero, right? No, those kind of probability uh, functions. Things are going badly in the world. And things are going badly in the world, in my view, to a large extent, because the people who know better, the people who should know better, put it more accurately, let it happen. They let it happen. They don't speak up. They don't oppose. They don't challenge, they don't withdraw their sanction. They continue to accept the will of the authorities, and the authorities are different in different places. I mean, one of the reasons I love organizations like Lion Rock, and, and Lion Rock is the only one in Hong Kong, is because they're not silent. And, and I, think, I think the only way to deal with what's going on in the world is not to be silent. But there's way too much silence. And the group most responsible for the silence, in my view, and this is, comes somewhat out of it, I have sure. The group that has the most power but doesn't recognize it and won't take on that power are the business leaders in every single one of these countries. Business is silent, or worse, they play the game. They cooperate with their authorities. They encourage more regulations greater complexity in the tax system. Trade barriers if you're on the right side of where the trade is headed, right? And yet, it is businessmen who keep society going. You look at Silicon Valley, what would the United States economy be like without Silicon Valley? If you take that piece out, I mean, the United States would be a disaster and a mess. And instead of and the reason Silicon Valley is, you know, why Silicon Valley is so successful? 
why have, of all the industries in the United States, is technology the one industry that is just continues to take off and has done very, very well? Because it's the one industry that it has almost no regulation. It's one industry that's being left alone. Do you know that in the United States we license government licenses? You need a license to pretty much do anything. I mean, kind of understand doctors and lawyers. I don't really, but let's let's assume that you know there's some kind of rationale to license doctors and lawyers. But we license in the United States people who shampoo hair. We license uh, nail salon operators. You know, God forbid you get some fungus on your nails or something. They need a government license in order to do this. You know what profession they, is not licensed? You know, the people that ultimately respond is responsible for the airplanes staying up in the, although I guess in, with Boeing they failed. Um, people responsible for nuclear power plants, the people responsible for your iPhone and everything else are not licensed. Programs. Programmers, there's no license. Government doesn't give permission for you to program. You just program. It gives permission for you to shampoo somebody else's head. <laughs> but you can program. The reason Silicon Valley is Silicon Valley, the reason it's been a success, is because we have left technology alone, at least in the United States and the West. And I think China will discover as it starts meddling with its tech industry more and more that innovation will decline and progress will decline. Is that not because they don't understand it? No, they don't understand finance, but they meddle constantly with finance. I would have loved, you remember when they brought, after the financial crisis, they brought all these CEOs of the banks, sat in front of Congress, and Congress asked them about CDOs, and about uh, options, and about all this stuff. I would have loved if one of those CEOs would have turned to one of the senators and said, um, I wonder if you could tell me what a CDO is. You're asking questions about it, you think you know what it is. None of them know what they, these things are. I mean, Alan Greenspan's argument, it's a weak argument, but Alan Greenspan's argument in the late 90s about why uh, they shouldn't regulate derivatives was that the regulators weren't sophisticated enough and knowledgeable enough to be able to regulate the derivatives. Uh, but that's true of all finance. They have no clue how finance works and they regulate it anyway. No, it's, it's, it's basically, it ha technology happened very quickly. It happened fast and they, they didn't get an opportunity to do it, but that's gonna change, right? They're talking now about breaking up Facebook, regulating Facebook, regulating Google, regulating Apple. Uh, they tried a little bit with Microsoft, right? And that's gonna intensify. So you're gonna see that change and you'll see innovation and everything else go down. And yet, here are the greatest beneficiaries of freedom, free markets, unregulated markets. They're all a bunch of radical lefties. They, they want, I mean, Zuckerberg said he wants to regulate himself. Maybe that's an act of self-defense. But they constantly are advocating for policies that would have destroyed the industry had they were, if they had been passed originally. Imagine if the CEOs of Silicon Valley stood up and said, no. Imagine if Zuckerberg had refused to come and be questioned by a bunch of ignorant, do-nothing, unproductive congressmen who had not employed anybody in their life, have not created anything in their life, but had actually said, I will not sit in front of you. You want to subpoena me? I've done something criminal? Sue me. Come after me. But I won't come and testify in front of you. I don't have to justify anything to you. The world would change. If one of them, if one of those bank CEOs stood up and said, who are you? What's that? Would it? I mean, I mean, maybe in the short run. Well, what we're lacking right now is arrogance. What we're lacking in the world right now, not arrogance, not arrogance of wealth, not arrogance, but arrogance of ideas. People who believe in something and stand up and state it. You know what? The left is unbelievably arrogant. Well, maybe it would be the tone. Well, I, no, I would say the tone should be as aggressive and hostile and arrogant as possible. Again, the left is unbelievably arrogant. They don't have any qualms about declaring truth to be what they think it is. And people just accept it. Now, it's true because they have, you know, what I even called the supposed moral high ground, they can get away with it. But the only way to recapture the moral high ground 
is to storm it and take it. You're not going to capture the moral high ground by being mealy mouth, by accepting the authority of people over you, by accepting a system that is going to destroy you. The only way to change the dynamics is for the business community to stand up and say enough is enough. Not to go on strike as they do in Atlas Shrugged, because I don't think there's a plan for that, but to actually argue against what is happening. But you would have to argue against them. That couldn't, you could not go. Because those people of course you could not go. You could, could those people are elected. So those what? People, so what? The same people, they, they make the laws. So what? So he's acting, Zuckerberg and his clan are acting in their rank. Yes, and, they can, and there's a consequence. And they will get regulated. The question is... They're playing the system. Like they're, they're playing the system. I, I agree with you completely. They, they but turn it's, up and they go, this is not who we are. We need to make but this, changes. But this is the point, right? Against, but know. this is the point. The point is that as long as business plays the system, as long as you participate in the commissions and are just a member and are just trying to skewer things a little bit better or a little bit in your favor, as long as you play the game, that short run game, because in the long run, they're all dead. But if you, now he'll be rich dead, so maybe it doesn't matter. But as long as you play that game, nothing will change. So I'm not saying I don't understand what Zuckerberg's doing. I understand completely what Zuckerberg's doing. I'm just saying. is less intervention, less regulation than would have been the case if he'd opted out. And he's what? He's achieved less regulation than if he sat, he's thumbed his nose and left an empty seat at the table uh, and being on the menu rather than at the table. I, you know, I disagree with that completely. I think we get more regulations, and once you once you open up the level of regulation, it is a flood. It, what, what, if, if, again, if businessmen, and it can be just one, granted, if it's just one, then it seems arrogant and out of touch. But, and, and there's no, you don't have to go and testify in front of Congress. There's no law that says you have to go in front of, in front of Congress. There are consequences if you don't, right? I, I don't know if you know the Microsoft story about testifying in front of Congress. So Microsoft used to, in the, in the mid-1990s, Microsoft used to spend zero dollars on lobbying. They didn't do anything in, 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 uh, in Washington, D.C. They, uh, they had no building in Washington, D.C. They had no, uh, nobody. Washington, D.C. was a desert from the perspective of Microsoft. And they were brought in front of Congress. And they were told by Arn Hatch, a Republican, that they had to start lobbying, that they had to build a building in Washington, D.C., that they had to hire lawyers, that it was their responsibility as citizens to bribe him. You know, <laughs> to buy all in half. And Microsoft said, to their credit, we're not interested. And they went away. They didn't give a reason. They didn't argue against it. They just went away. Six months later, knock on the door. We're here from the Justice Department. And we're suing you for antitrust violations. What was the violation in this case? Anybody know? What's that? Internet Explorer. Yeah, they were giving Internet Explorer away for free. Can't do that. Particularly when Netscape is charging me 80 bucks, you know, to download the, the you know, in those days for those young people, yeah. in order to browse the internet you had to pay, right? right? Now you can do it for free because Microsoft introduced Internet Explorer for free. What lesson did Microsoft learn from this? And this is the lesson Zuckerberg supposedly is learning, right? You play the game. You play the game. So now, how much money does Microsoft spend on Washington D.C.? They have this beautiful building. Funnily enough, right behind Cato, right? the Cato Institute, about equal distance from the White House and Congress, massive glass, modern building. They spent tens of millions of dollars on lobbying. Is the world better for Microsoft having done that? Microsoft might be better in the short run. But is the world better for Microsoft having folded? I don't think so. And of course, Microsoft shouldn't have been alone. Again, I'm not arguing that one person do this. Business people have to do it. If you don't, then we'll keep sliding along on the slope, and maybe the slide will be slower because you participated and slowed it down a little bit, but the direction is the same direction. You have to start standing up and saying no, or not participating, or saying, okay, you want to regulate me, I'm not going to sanction that, I'm not going to be at the table. And here's why, you have to give the why. Because otherwise you come across as just, you know, just obnoxious. You have to give the reasons. So, if by striking and shrugging, 
You mean stopping to cooperate with those who, try, who are trying to destroy you? Then I think it's about time business stood up and did that before you're really destroyed. And you can't do it by yourself. You can't do it one at a time. So there has to be a movement. And businessmen are unbelievably powerful in society. Not only because they produce the revenue, they produce the jobs, they produce all the innovations that we have. People respect businessmen, they still do, particularly in America. And you, you think it, it needs to come from the business sector and not political reform? That you would no, political reform will never work, never has worked, and won't work. It has to come from the people. And, you know, uh, you get the politicians you deserve. Milton Friedman said that you create rules in such a way that That's right. the worst people can't mess it up. So yeah, and how did that work out for Milton? Well, no. He, he, gave us the negative, he gave us a negative income tax. He gave us a withholding. I mean, I love Milton Friedman, right? But all his little proposals all backfired against us. All of them turned out to be tools for the enemies of those of us who believe in freedom. Because it exactly that. He played the game. And you play the game, you're giving the enemy the tools to come after you. You're not, you have to challenge what they're actually doing. Now, I'm not saying you can do it all at once. But you have to start speaking up. You have to start arguing, not for an incremental change, but for radical change. You won't get radical change. But if you don't argue for it, it won't even move in that direction. I just don't think you'll get I know. I mean, that's my frustration in life. One of the many frustrations so what in life. What you're asking them to do is act other than their rational self-interest. Exactly. No, I'm asking them. I'm asking them to act in their rational self-interest, not in their cutting the deal. Short, they cut. Negotiating and lobbying. Well, if you, if, if, if you, it's not in their rational self-interest to do any of that. They lose both self-esteem. They lose. They lose uh, integrity. And at the end of the day. Companies their businesses become. I mean, look at what look at what happened. Look at what happened to the banking industry in the United States. I mean, is it fun to be a banker in America? It's not fun to be a banker anyway. <laughs> and there's a reason for that. Why is it not fun to be a banker anyway? Because of regulations. Because of regulations. Because of red tape. Now, initially, they played the game. Oh no, they they were just trying to survive. But they destroyed their own profession by doing it. It's a disaster to be a banker anyway. 150, 150 regulators go to work at J.P. Morgan every day. It's not a private bank. It's a public utility run by the government that pretends to be private because it has shareholders. But nothing that is done at J.P. Morgan is not done without the approval of some bureaucrat who signs off. Now, how did that happen? But you've got to recognize that it says it keeps something to go. So uh, uh, right now in Hong Kong, uh, uh, SFC is proposing complex, uh, uh, complex product regulation. The banks will no longer be allowed to accept reverse order inquiries unless they've done due diligence on the, the products. So what, what I work for a bank. Uh, what we need is a, either a bank or a client to sue the regulator to tell them, we will not accept you telling us we cannot pass an order of own free will. Yeah. Now, find me the bank or the client who's going to sue. I'm, I'm with you. I know. I'm just expressing my frustrations. I'm not disagreeing with any of you who think this is not going to happen tomorrow. My argument is it should happen, not will it or won't it. Right? But my argument is deeper. Unless it happens, we're on the slippery slope, and I don't see an end to that slippery slope. I don't think things just go back and forth and there's a nice little pendulum and we'll turn against socialism and then you know uh, we'll reach a certain point of wealth and then we'll turn towards socialism and it is it's nice no every time the pendulum swings it swings more left or more statist or more interventionist or, or, or you know every time there's a financial crisis the solution is not huh I wonder what the regulations were that caused this crisis because if you really study it you know that all these crises happen because of the structure of regulation. It's what more regulations could we impose on the industry, which of course will cause the next crisis. And of course no banker is gonna say, I mean I know like one who said this, no, 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 it's this, it's original regulations that caused this crisis, right? And you know, John Allison, I don't know if you know John Allison, John Allison was the uh, CEO of the 10th largest financial institution in the United States. And he went on stage, and he went to the regulator, and he said this to everybody who would listen. But he was one guy. 
And he left BB&T, left his bank with a lot of self-respect and a lot of self-esteem because he fought the fight. He didn't win, but he fought it. Ron, can I just sure. um, accuse you of being far too optimistic at this point? Which <laughs> is normally my role here. Yeah. That, that having been on various business chains in Hong Kong, the, the point that's been discussed here is very vivid in my mind, that you would never find anyone who would go against the system. They were doing what David would do, which is to milk the system for their own benefit and think they were being moral doing that, which is, and we haven't talked about the morality but the reason I think it's worse is we don't have business people not speaking out today. We have business people in the newspapers every day saying capitalism has failed, yes. right? They are now joining the chorus to destroy themselves. Now, where is that coming from? Well, to some extent, they're not going to destroy themselves in this short term, in a short term perspective because they've already made their money. What they're destroying is the capacity of young people to follow in their footsteps. I don't know if you've been watching Ray Dalio make the circuits yes, well, about the evils that, of that, capitalism. Yeah, yeah. All the evils he lists yeah. are statist evils. Yeah. All the evils he lists are caused by statism or caused by government intervention. But he names capitalism as their source. And by doing so, he is destroying the system that made him the richest hedge fund guy yeah. in history. Okay. What's that? You're on the guilt trip. Well, but they're all on a guilt trip, and this goes to the uh, this goes to the to the to the to the moral essential of Atlas Shrugged. And unless we learn the moral lesson, in my view, they were all on a guilt trip. And much of the motivation around this is not I'm going to scheme the system so I can stay rich and screw everybody else. It's exactly I feel guilty, and I'm going to fix the world by you know by regulating, by redistributing wealth, by whatever. I'm going to fix it so. Other people don't have to feel the guilt that I feel. But it pays to be guilty. But, but, but life is not about money. I mean, I, I, I know that sounds guilty. weird coming from me. Uh, it, you know, I, life's not about money. Sure, it pays financially to feel guilty. But it sucks when it comes to happiness. I'm just surprised that you think that this is an easier route than trying to get political ideas forward. Well, it's not easier. Well, who is going to get political ideas changed? Who is going to do that? Well, the, the, so, no, I'm, I'm serious. The choices of another Thatcher and so, Reagan coming through. But Thatcher and Reagan did nothing. Or at least Thatcher did more than Reagan. But 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 in yeah, the big yeah, picture, so what did Reagan do? He 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 gave us five to ten years of, of semi-sanity and reduced regulations a little bit, reduced taxes a lot, but increased spending. So then immediately after he left office, taxes were raised. So what did Reagan actually do? He regulated. Well, no, well, most of the deregulation well, actually happened Thatcher under Jimmy Carter. Huge amount of, so, what's that? Thatcher did a huge amount of I, Thatcher did a lot. She and when you elect she Corbyn, when you elect Corbyn, you will realize well, that political change, well, you, <laughs> you won't, but you go to. Political change, political change does not last. I think you're. you're political change does not last. You're not going to get a single panacea, but I mean, you can get incrementally if you can get the ideas. Okay, so right. again, I mean, Rather we, than getting the entire business community to suddenly go against their own uh, I mean, what is the incremental change that you got? That you got the increments. Were, were, they, they went through through Thatcher. Immediately upon Thatcher leaving, things started to at least flatten out. There was no real incremental change after that. Then they started reversing, but very slowly under Blair. And now they're in freefall, right? Now they're in freefall, or, or, or potentially could be in freefall. Nothing fundamentally changed. That's why Brexit is such an opportunity. Yeah, it's an opportunity. You know why, you know why Jeremy Corbyn is for Brexit? Because it's an opportunity for Britain to move towards socialism faster than the European Union would allow. I mean, that's the reality. You're looking at the socialist angle. I'm looking at the politics, at the reality of politics. But the proportion of the world living, living under socialism or central planning at the levels of it, like is USA, much lower USA, than it used to be. China. We're, we're left with pockets of it that haven't that have visibly failed. Venezuela won't stay the way it is for long because the people won't take it. Yes. The, the, the Tunisian Spring was about the price of bread and the and level the of control. The so the, 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 there is a dynamic, complex system in the world. It's not a pendulum. But See, this is why we're not going to win this battle. People I mean, you're not going to win this battle. You're not going to win the battle for freedom. 
you, you're gonna, yes, you might get a Reagan or Thatcher who will move it a little bit, but of course we've, we, you know, we'll, we'll always be, we'll always be shifting left. We'll always, we'll always be moving towards greater and greater mm -hmm. statism. Mm -hmm. Yes, it'll happen slowly. It'll be a boiling frog, and once in a while, the, the water temperature will go down, and the frog will think how things are getting better. And one day you'll wake up, and it'll all be gone, because you don't want fundamental change. You, you want it, you want little political stuff. Politics doesn't change anything. But we want the second change. No, I'm not sure we do. I'm not sure we're getting there slightly. No, my way of getting there is I don't think you can get to freedom without philosophical, fundamental philosophical change. I don't think you can get there without convincing people of new radical ideas. Human nature. No, I'm not talking about human nature. Ideas are not human nature. Ideas are consequences. I think the ideas of the left are anti-human nature. So I'm I'm for showing the left, illustrating to the to people that the ideas that they hold are actually against human nature. Because every time they're practiced, they lead to death and destruction. But it's not enough to show that they lead to death and destruction. It's to show that they're immoral, that they're actually wrong, that people live... Yes, which is the political... That's not political. That There's nothing that in politics that shows that. Ideas the no! Go against their, their own personal... Yeah. Politics yeah. is about policy, not about morality or about philosophy. But your idea is entirely about morality. You're saying that... I'm so saying businessmen should cease playing the game. Yes. And then cease playing. Yes. I'm not saying it's going to happen, so don't worry. Uh, your path is the path that's actually going to be practiced. I'm saying the only way we're going to succeed is if people start arguing for a different morality. And to the extent that you don't argue for a different morality, the politics will fail. The politics will fail. Not in a very short run, but over time they will fail. And I view a shortcut to accelerating the spread of a proper morality if businessmen actually took up this message Martin. and conveyed it. What's that? Martin, but, uh, no, I don't think they would I don't think they would, I, I don't think they would martyr themselves. I think that actually they actually can we, can we come back to Brazil? Sure. Do you mean I've always thought that the only thing that could trigger people standing up for for the moral way of living would be an absolute disaster. And it may happen in this way. But, but Brazil got to such a point that people rejected all the existing policies, and some people did stand up and say, we're not going to take this anymore. So in the West, do we need a disaster before we can get it? So I think, I mean, I, I mean, obviously Winston knows a lot more about what happened in Brazil than I do. But this is uh, Winston Ling, who's, who's very involved in what's going on right now in Brazil, partially responsible for it. <laughs> I think there's a company, I mean, the good stuff, not the best. <laughs> I think Brazil, there was a combination of things. Because there's been a lot of people going out into the streets. There's been a lot of things are a disaster, we need to change course. There was Ukraine, you remember the, 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 the it, nothing came of, of the revolution in Ukraine. Uh, nothing has come of most of these. In Venezuela, we've been waiting for Venezuela to actually flip for a couple of years, months certainly. And the opposition leader, if you actually look at what the opposition leader stands for, he's a socialist. He's just a different type of socialist than Maduro. He's not actually advocating for freedom. He's not act actually advocating for free markets. What happened in, in Brazil is, Winston, correct me if I'm wrong, both the collapse, a, a promise made to young people unfulfilled, and massive real frustration. And at the same time, after the ground was prepared with the right ideas to be brought in front of those young people. So Winston and, and other people in Brazil in the 80s were working hard to promote ideas of liberty and ideas of freedom, bringing them into the business community, bringing those ideas, educating people about the right ideas, preparing the ground for the day where people were so frustrated that they were looking for something different. And when people went out to the streets a few years ago in, in Brazil to demonstrate, there was, a, 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 there was an energy around free market ideas that I have never seen anywhere else in the world. And I think it is the work of think tanks, of intellectuals, of business, a lot of the business community, huge number of the business community, in preparing the ground for that so that Brazilians were wearing t-shirts that said, 
in, in, in Portuguese, less smocks, more Mises. I mean, more von Mises. Like, nobody knows who von Mises is in the world among young people, right? And here were people walking in the streets with such t-shirts signifying that people knew what that meant. Now that was a lot of intellectual groundwork, a lot of intellectual work that had been done in order to do that. And, and look, I'm optimistic about Brazil, and I, and I want to be optimistic about Brazil, but we'll see how it turns out. Say, there's there's certainly no guarantees. Yeah, don't you end up with then the, somehow people connected with them to the system, they'll end up with their protected benefits, and then there will be a backlash against them as, as well, because there's this sort of privilege always. There is a lot of worry that that happens in yeah. Brazil, and be, yeah. because while the intellectual foundation has been built, it isn't wide enough yeah. and it isn't deep enough. So there's still a lot of challenges. I don't know if you know what happened in Brazil, but Bolsonaro, who is a very mixed guy, became president. But what he did is he appointed as his economic czar, the guy responsible for everything economic, probably the leading free market economist in Brazil. So the, the equivalent of a Milton Friedman in Brazil. So uh, Chile. What's that? So it's, it's going to be like Chile. Um, and, and look, it, that's great, but if you look at Chile, yeah, I mean, they, they, they was, they've been sliding backwards. They, they've sliding forward again in the recent elections. They go back and forth. Um, but isn't that the problem, the, the perennial problem, like you say? How do, we, how do we stop that? You stop it by changing the fundamental ideas that people hold. That's not anti-human nature. That's changing the ideas that exist in the culture. The dominant ideas in the culture, the dominant moral idea in the culture is a pro-statist, pro-socialist, idea. And, and until you rid the world of that idea, the idea that your purpose in life as an individual is to serve others, morality is all about sacrifice and service and being selfless, that is the core idea together with, you know, with, with replacing whatever mysticism is out there with, with the advocacy of reason. Those two ideas, reason and, and egoism or moral egoism, are the two ideas that are the foundation of liberty, that are the foundation of freedom. It's why freedom was born at the end of the Enlightenment, because the Enlightenment was the, uh, the rediscovery, if you will, of those two ideas. If you think about the Enlightenment thinkers, what are they advocating for in the 18th century? They're advocating for reason as the way in which we know the world. The, 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 they didn't negate mysticism, but they said, relegate it to your private life, keep it at home. Right? Reason should stay at home. Uh, re mysticism should stay at home. Uh, reason is what really matters. And the second was, it's manifest in the Declaration of Independence. The purpose of life is the pursuit of happiness. You're happy. Those are the two ideas, moral and epistemological, that ultimately underlie the foundation of liberty. And unless you capture those two, unless a businessman, but all of us in a sense, stand up and say, my moral purpose in life is my own happiness. And I'm not going to accept your authority over my life. I'm not going to accept you telling me I am a sacrifice for others. It's education. Yeah. Can I just yes, it's all it's all education. At the end of the day, I'll just say this, and then I'll. Uh, the, my point about businessmen is one: I think it'd be good for the businessmen. I actually do think it'd be good for them. Not maybe in the monetary sense, but in the spiritual sense. But also, I think it would accelerate education because we would give voice to the ideas from people who the general public respects, rather than intellectuals like me, who, who cares. But people who actually produced and created and built, people respect those people. It would accelerate the educational process. The businessman would still have to rely on intellectuals to kind of explain it all and flesh it out, but at least they would give voice to something that is implicit in what they do. Right? but would now be explicit and now be messaged across the yeah. yeah, I just wanted to say something that I think picks up on and agrees with that. Which I, I've got a poor memory, but I think in Atlas Shrugged, uh, Francisco D'Anconio sat down with Hank Reardon after his famous money speech and was talking about why he'd said what he, was, what he said. And he said, I'm here to give you the words for when you need them most. And the point is that he was trying to give these people words. Firstly, a thought that you don't need to feel guilty about the fact that you created the world, that you created wealth. Secondly, that they don't owe anyone anything. Thirdly, that they don't have to feel, because of their guilt about being wealthy, that they should submit to regulation. 
And so that was one of the key things that came out of the book for me. But the next point was the point that people won't stand up. And I say that people who won't stand up are cowards. You know, when Hong Kong tried to introduce competition law here, I stood up. I said, this is wrong for Hong Kong. This is wrong in the shape that it is. I was threatened by the central government. I couldn't go to China for a couple of years because I was worried about that. I'm a competition lawyer. I've got a huge amount of money to make by having a competition law, but I had the guts to stand up and say that. People do stand up. And as a lawyer, I think back to Nazi Germany and the criticism that was made of lawyers is that people did not stand up. Lawyers did not stand up. They did not say this is wrong. And so I think it's wrong to say that business people will not stand up. Some people will. I think you have to look at the people who are not standing up and you have to say, why are they not standing up? And when will they stand up? And I think people sometimes will. And it comes back to the point in the book. It's here to give you the words for when you need them and for if you are prepared to stand up. And so I agree with all these people are saying, yeah, there's a lot of people who are too scared to stand up in the world. But I say some people will. Well, and, 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 and they need the courage. It's about coming courage. back to the point about going on strike, the people who went on strike were the people who went on strike against the government. They were not the people who went on strike against ideas. Those people kept working. They kept spreading their ideas. They did not go on strike. And those, to me, are the fundamental points that comes out of this book. I, I, I mean, I agree completely. And it's, it's, uh, they're always courageous people. If you study the history of Nazi Germany, they were the businessmen who stayed and cooperated and helped Germany build the war machine and helped help them produce the gas that killed people and all of that. And then there were some businessmen who stood up and they left. Or they, you know, and, and, and they took massive risks. And they, what's that? Fine. But the question is, the question is, did you as an individual, now imagine, imagine if all of those businessmen had stood up and walked out, then you wouldn't have had an security. Imagine if, 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 the, if the chemical industry had refused to produce the stuff that they wanted, or if certain, that would have been amazing. And, but it's easy to sit back and say, that would have been amazing, but I'm not going to stand up. Right? If it, was, if it would have been amazing, then do it. We're not maybe faced with Nazi Germany, but we're faced on a slippery slope heading in that direction. And the question is, what is it going to take? You stand for president. president. What's that? <laughs> you stand for president. Would I stand for president? I mean, I wouldn't for two reasons. I often get that question, asked that question for two reasons. One is I would lose in a landslide. Um, and second, I, I was born in the US, so I can't. Um, what's that? I, 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 uh, you have to be born in the US to stand for president. Can I ask um, sure. a question on ideas here? The, yeah. And business. We just said business as a single bucket. But if you if you look at individual business people who have started up their own business, some in this room, who still own and run their own business, they will be far more inclined to believe in free markets and resent regulation. It's the large listed companies that are on stock exchanges that have governance impositions from those stock exchanges, otherwise you'll get delisted and Zuckerberg is just one of those, that that effect on business is so corrosive um, that it, it means that many of us here have worked in many large businesses which are full of people at senior levels who are basically socialists. Because the regulatory environment that they live in is socialism. But that's different from small yeah. businesses everywhere in the world where their natural inclination is to accept the ideas we're talking about. Say, yeah, of course I don't want the government to tell me what to do. I want to keep what I make and I don't want it taxed away. I mean, I, so I, should we be distinguishing different bits of business? I don't completely agree. I mean, two things. One, I don't think it's exchanges. And I, I don't think it's exchanges' fault. The exchanges have no choice. The SEC basically runs the regulatory environment. The exchanges just the facilitators. It's, it's, it's government. It, I mean, I wish the exchanges were the regulators, because then there'd be competition for regulation. Different exchanges would have different regulations, and you could decide under who to list based on what kind of regulatory regime you wanted. That's the solution to getting rid of insider trading laws and all these laws that I think are, are, are horrific because they're one size fit all and, they, and they're not objective. Whereas the, you can self regulate through exchanges to deal with all of that. But I've met many small businessmen who say, who typically say this to me, they say, and this is where it's about ideas, they say, yes, I don't need to be regulation, I am an honest guy, 
everything we do is by the book. It's always really good. But that other industry over there, they're a bunch of damn crooks. And if we didn't have regulations, then they would all cheat and everybody. And, 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 and I see this over and over and over again. I, don't, I shouldn't pay more taxes, but those guys should because, you know, the bankers, they're the real bad guys. If you want bad guys, it's always the bad You should read my book uh, called uh, The Mall Case of Finance. Um, it's always the financiers, right? So, so there's always, so, so even among small businessmen, even among people who own their own business, there isn't that commitment to freedom because it's not ideological, it's, it's more on the, on the practical side. And among the listed companies, there are exceptions, right? It's true that for the most part, they are forced in a sense to toe a line and uh, they're afraid to stand up. I mean, one of the things John Allison would always say is he was running a publicly listed company and he'd say, I'd always have to think about, am I gonna say something that hurts my shareholders? Because my fiduciary duty is to my shareholders. And it's, 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 a, it's a massive challenge. I think he, you know, when uh, you know, it, it, the US Supreme Court ruled on eminent domain, the Kelo decision, it was a famous decision in the US where the Supreme Court said, we're gonna allow the taking of people's homes in order to build a Walmart, in order to build a mall, right? For, for private benefit. And John Allison, the, the next morning, BB&T came out with a press release saying, we will not lend any money to a project where eminent domain was used to take the property of some for the sake of others. Now that took balls and he could have lost a lot. Turns out a lot of people who liked that statement sent their money to BB&T. So the deposits actually grew as a consequence of taking a moral stand. And I think what business women would discover if they did it is that they would actually get support and they would actually find it, you know, find that it, it, it profited them. That was in probably a, a commercial calculation on his part. He never made the commercial calculation. He didn't make the commercial calculation. Could I um, suggest that the, to, to the point that um, yep. that's made, well, in some ways Hong Kong might again be an example of what you're suggesting. Um, and, and I'm not sure if Hong Kong is the same today, but at a certain point in time, Perhaps we do owe what freedoms we have in Hong Kong to businessmen that did exactly what you're saying. Because Jardine Group moved the domicile of all of their companies away from Hong Kong. That showed China what might happen en masse um, uh, if they didn't do things properly. Most of the big Chinese tycoons had a word in the ear, and I think it was well understood in Beijing what would happen if they didn't do things in a way that preserved certain freedoms. Now I'm not sure if that's happening today when those threats might be bigger, but I think in many ways it was pretty clear that the reason Hong Kong has the basic law that it has that preserves some of the freedoms that it does is because the business community in Hong Kong made it clear there would be no business community in Hong Kong if China didn't play things within some constraints. <coughs> I think that's, I mean, I don't know the history, but I would not be surprised at all. And I'd say the flip side, it, it works in the flip, in the reverse as well. When businessmen start compromising is when you get the biggest, when they don't stand up is when you get the biggest interventions. You know, I, I, you know think, think in the United States and the history of the US, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, I, you know, count in, in opposition to Milton Friedman, I don't believe in central banking, right? And the United States only got a central bank in, in, uh, in uh, 1914. It was only the capitulation of J.P. Morgan and the big bankers in New York who said, okay, we give him, we're gonna play the game now and we're gonna help you structure the, the central bank in a way that helps us, that we got that. If they had stood firm, who knows what would have happened. Uh, we're now facing a situation where the internet is going to get regulated. One wonders if the Zuckerbergs and the Googles and the Amazons of the world actually stand firm. Not just by saying no for the sake of no, but actually making an argument against it and declaring their independence if that would slow it down or not even stop it in its track. Right? By, by saying we're going to participate, this is exactly what J.P. Morgan did in the, 19, in, in the teens, which got us a central bank. Uh, you're going to get massive regulation of the internet coming down the pipe. Both Republicans and Democrats want it now. And, and the industry's capitulated. So when the industry capitulates is when you get more forceful government, and I think when, government, when industry actually stands up and shows the consequences is when, you get, is when you get a retreat. So 
I mean, businessmen have an enormous amount of power, intellectual power, PR power. And it's the guilt, but it's also the lack of confidence, the, 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 the lack of confidence. And of course, more than anything, it's a lack of ideas. You know, they have to believe in it to have the courage to do it. So first comes the belief and then the courage. And if they're feeling guilty, they don't believe it. And therefore, they can't be courageous. And I'd say our job, right, as, as think tanks, as intellectuals, is to give the business community the knowledge and to help them with the courage to actually stand up. Because again, I don't think you'll get fundamental change unless you do that. The so, home's got the luxury of a low tax, very simple system. Yep. We fill out our tax return, it takes about three minutes. Yep. Um, very straightforward. It seems like every other country, including the US, is just one big bureaucracy that just sucks everything <coughs> in and nobody has any way of resisting it. Because there's a permanent, there's a permanent sort of um, civil service, permanent bureaucracy, yeah. permanent sort of vested interests. Sure. So, you know, how do you blow it up? Because that's my objective. My, my objective is, you know, destroy them. And mm -hmm. well, the, blow them up. The but, only way... But, no. but blow them up, you know, politically, figuratively. Yes. Like, figuratively. I mean, the how only do you institutionally <laughs> blow up the institutions? How do you destroy the institutions of a bureaucracy that has a uniparty structure that just kind of likes to bring, you know, interchange everybody and I mean, so how do you blow up the institution? So I stuff? agree with you that it has to be blown up because yes. I don't think incrementally it's going to change, yes. right? And I don't think uh, Steve Forbes running on a flat tax on a postcard is, gets anywhere because it doesn't get anywhere because the institutions are too powerful to attack it. The only way it gets blown up is that people stand up against it. If people say, if, if people, you know, it, 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 there was the beginning of this where, where companies in the U.S. were domiciling outside of the U.S., yeah. right? Now they passed laws that make that almost impossible. But imagine they did that in mass, but said why, right? Declared the reason for it, not just did it stealthily, you know, to avoid it, but actually said. Imagine if Apple said, no, we are trying to evade taxes in the U.S. because taxes in the U.S. are nuts, they're insane. That's why we funnel all our taxes through Ireland. We're not ashamed of it, we're not embarrassed, right? When you fix your home here in Washington, D.C., you know, then, then, then we'll consider it. Now, granted, that, that's scary to do that. It's really scary as a business person to do that. But imagine, and I'm not saying it's gonna happen, because it's not, unfortunately, anytime soon, but the only way to blow it up is for people to stand up and declare that the system is corrupt, that they are not willing to play the game and that they will find any means by which to escape it. It's not gonna blow up because a bunch of intellectuals at think tanks say it's a corrupt system. It just won't blow up. I mean, maybe we'll make incremental changes, but we're not gonna blow up the system. So if you wanna blow up, I think that's the only way to do it. Everybody should move like I did to Puerto Rico, where I don't pay federal taxes anymore. How much you pay? But I, as an American, taxes less, less than Hong Kong. Yeah, but less than even as an American. So as an American. As an American in Hong Kong, as an, I, tax. I know, you get, country, you're screwed. The world yes, that, because that, you, it, it's a new business model. We're going to create a... Because you should have moved to Puerto Rico. So there are only three places on planet Earth where an American citizen does not pay federal taxes. Guam, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico, because these are all territories of the United States where you as an American citizen living in them do not vote in federal elections. I don't vote for president, I don't vote for Senate and the House. Therefore, no representation, no taxation. So there's no federal taxes in those three jurisdictions. On top of that, Puerto Rico is, in order to attract people to come to the island, has said if you're an American who moves to Puerto Rico, and sets up a business that is a service business that ex that brings money into the you, the corporation pays four percent taxes. Your capital gains taxes are zero. Your dividend taxes, that is your distribution taxes from the corporation, are zero. You pay yourself a small salary. I pay myself a very small salary. You pay taxes to Puerto Rico on the salary. Other than that, you pay the four percent, and that is it. So my effective tax rate today is less than 4% because I get a significant amount of money from capital gains, 4%. Is the electricity back on? Yet? What's that? 
No, Tusi is back on the island. The island is, is uh, I didn't move. I didn't move until the electricity was back. Oh, you brought a generator. <laughs> no, my building has a generator. It had a generator before I moved in. Yes. So I'm hearing businessmen disrupt uh, all this yeah. sort of stuff. I'm just curious yeah. now, what's your scorecard on Trump? Because he is certainly a disruptor. You don't want He's a disruptor for what? What, what? what is he? What is he trying to achieve? Well, that's what I'd like your view on, because to me, he's all over the place. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he is a disruptor in the name of statism. He's a disruptor in the name of central planning. He is a disruptor that will bring America more statism, more control, less freedom he than anything. Uh, who cares if you cut taxes when you raise spending? I mean, really, guys, if you cut taxes and you raise spending. You're not cutting anything. You're still sucking money out of the private economy through the issues of debt. Economically, you're not changing the game. I would argue that it's better to raise taxes and actually reduce debt than it is to lower taxes. And by the way, every Republican president in human history has cut taxes. There's nothing unique about uh, about Trump. Uh, Bush cut taxes. Uh, the only the only Republican who didn't was Bush Sr. He raised taxes. But every other Republican is always, that's easy. Cutting taxes is easy. It's a cutting spending that's hard. Yeah. So Trump, in my view, is a disaster. Uh, he's going to make the country a lot worse, not a lot better. He's probably going to generate a massive swing to the left to, to reject him. Whether it happens this coming election, I don't know. But ultimately, I think the country is heading leftwards. Uh, and if he represents Republicans, then it becomes that there's no alternative to the left because what has he done? He has basically institutionalized Bernie Sanders' agenda. I mean, the left, you remember the, you know the term he uses all the time, fair trade? Who invented the term fair trade? The radical left, years ago. Because they wanted, what was fair trade? Fair trade was that the United States should only trade with people if they imposed the same regulatory and workplace standards that we had in the United States. That was fair. He's embraced that, right? So now everybody, right, left, center, all talk about fair trade as if there's such a thing, right? The only, the only, all trade is fair. Because I won't trade with you and then I'm gonna get better from it. And you won't trade with me unless you're gonna win from it. By definition, trade is a, is a, is a fair engagement. Um, if you think about, if you, if, you know, if you think of government spending, under Obama, Republicans held government spending low in the six years where, the, where they had the Congress. Actually, if you look at the Economic Freedom Index, the United States rose significantly under Obama uh, in the Economic Freedom Index because they held spending. What has happened since Trump is in office? Spending is through the roof. Deficit, you know, debt is now 22 trillion. It's growing at about a trillion a year, just under a trillion a year. We doubled the debt. We doubled the debt in the first two years. And then it's then no, it's the stable. Went from nine to eight. Yeah, true. Yes. So I mean, yeah. I mean, that's a false narrative that you some, that somehow. No, 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 no. If you, if if you, you party cycles, Obama of excuses. Obama no. reduced. I, I'm not an Obama fan. I hate Obama. But Obama reduced spending as a percentage of GDP during the last six years because Republicans who held the legislature would not let him spend more. <laughs> under 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 Trump. Spending as a percent of GDP is going through the roof. Okay, anyway, but I'll, I could disagree because he, he depleted the Social Security Fund by putting eight more million people on disability and just drew down the reserves there. I mean, it's just like government gimmicks of accounting. I mean, so my point is, anyway. We, All government spending as a percentage of GDP actually stabilized under Obama and went down a little bit. And under, under Trump, it is going out of control. I mean, just look at the numbers. This is not me. Be partisan. This is just the numbers. I don't know who partisan I would be on which party. But the, the, the fact is, and if you look at the Economic Freedom Index, which is a you know neutral thing, the United States went from 18 to single digit under the last six years of Obama. Not because of Obama, not because he believes in any of this stuff, but because Republicans are a really good opposition party, and they're a terrible governing party. And in opposition, they hold the Democratic president. And they did the same thing with Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton in his last six years was a pretty good president. Not because he's a good guy, he's a horrible guy, but because the Republicans <laughs> and that Newt Gingrich held him in check. But if you look at George Bush, government spending tripled under Trump. It was out of control. Why? Because he had the Senate and he had the House. What's that? I mean, it's, these are just numbers. So 
Uh, indeed, if you look at American history, the best combination for government spending, which I take as a proxy for economic freedom, right? The best proxy, I think, is government spending because it, it, it proxies for size. The best combination for government spending is a Democratic president, a Republican House and Senate. The second best is a Republican president and a Democratic House and Senate. The third, the third best is all Republican, and the very worst is all Democrat. But all Republican is third. Right? Divided government, unfortunately, works because this so on principle. The politicians don't have a, polit a, a, a political philosophy. They just go with the wind. And the same thing happened under Reagan. Reagan government spending went out of control, and that led to bad stuff following it. it look, politics is the outcome. If you want to change the politics, you have to change people's beliefs about the world. In 1831, 18, 18, the repeal of the Corn Laws. Yeah, that's fantastic. But you know what? You know what led to the you know what led to the repeal of the Corn Laws? 130 years of intellectual work, and suddenly Adam Smith writing in 1776, publishing uh, uh, the the uh, his Wealth of Nations. It didn't just happen because of politics. It happened because of 130 years of Enlightenment education so about what was going on. And it wasn't 1830. It was later, I think. But anyway. So well, we've had another 200 years of that. Well, 150 years. No, we've had 200 years of not doing that and of buying into the system and being co-opted by the system and participating in the system but and not fighting it. And the number of voices that are yelling for true free trade is minuscule. It's minuscule. So what's your view on the China-U.S. trade issues? What issues? I mean, what issues existed? The, the, I, I, I think the two issues relating to China. What is a trade deficit? I have a massive trade deficit with my grocery store. I go to the grocery store, I leave all my money there, I take the goods, and they never hire me. They've never hired me. They never give me my money back. What's up with that? Right? Trade deficits are meaningless from an economics perspective. They, they, they mean zero. It's actually not a bad thing to have a trade deficit. It means you've got, you're sending them paper money, you're getting their stuff. Stuff is always better than paper money. And they take that paper money, and what do they do with it? They buy your treasuries. I mean, the United States is a massive beneficiary of the trade deficit. So trade deficits are actually, in the United States case, right now, a good thing. The second issue is theft of intellectual property. Fine. How do we deal with theft? By taxing ourselves? How do you deal with theft? How do we deal with Louis Vuitton bags that are stolen? You don't allow them into the United States. You, if, you, if, they, if you receive them, you confiscate them. And you, you, it's not that you put tariffs on them. You don't deal with them. You don't trade with them. Okay, so if there's a high-tech product made in China that you can show that is using stolen IP, then boycott it. Ban it. Don't bring it into the United States. But let's be honest. This isn't about Donald Trump. It's not about... IP. He doesn't give one iota about IP. He's never thought about IP. He doesn't care about IP. He truly believes that trade is a zero-sum, negative-sum game. He thinks we're losing by trading with China. And we're not. We're actually massively benefiting with trade with China. The reason manufacturing jobs... What do you think? Does the United States manufacture more stuff or less stuff than it did 30 years ago? Stuff, right? It, it manufacturing in the United States has gone through the roof. But the number of people working in manufacturing is half. Why? Because of China? Because of automation. It has nothing to do with China. 90% of the so-called job losses are a consequence of automation. Maybe 10% because of China, Mexico, and the rest of the world. So all of this is, is bogus economics. What Trump really is about is winning. He's a narcissist. He wants to win. He loves winning. It's, it's fun to win, right? And he has figured out that the way to win is by creating enemies. This is something statists and authoritarians have known forever. And Trump ran a campaign on three principles. And what scares me is the American people bought these principles. Principle number one, everything is falling apart. Life sucks in America. Right? This carnage in the streets of America, that's a line out of his in, uh, inauguration speech. Crime in America, violent crime in America has never been lowered. Literally, never been lowered. I don't know if you visit New York and you go on a stroll in Central Park. I remember the 1970s 
where you wouldn't go to Central Park during the day. Today, I would have no problems walking in Central Park at 2 a.m. Crime has probably never been lower in the United States, but this carnage in the streets of America, life sucks. We're losing jobs. Unemployment, even in 2016, was pretty low, but we're losing jobs, nobody's employed. Um, there's factories closing everywhere around us. Nonsense. Basically drew a picture of an America that's dark, of everybody left behind, of things being truly horrible. Okay, next, whose fault is it? Well, it can't be ours. God forbid, we Americans, we're good guys. We haven't done anything bad. Who caused all this carnage in the streets of America and the closing of the plants? Well, it's those other people. Now, in the old days, you would have said it's the Jews. But we can't say that, it's politically incorrect, so we can't point to Jews. So it's the illegal immigrants. Or, you know, really it's immigrants generally, because he, you know, he, was, he attacked H-1Bs as the, even the legal immigrants. It's those Chinese. It's even the Japanese and Koreans, because they, they sell us cars. I mean, what a chutzpah, right? That's a good Jewish word. So they sell us cars. We should be producing our own cars, and they sell us cars at, at good prices. It's other. It's the elites. Now, that one is right, but it's the elites, right? It's the other. They look different than you. They think different than you. You should fear them and resent them. What are we going to do about it? Trust me. I ran a business, I built buildings, I know how to fix them. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> no, Hillary was completely different. She was awful, she was evil. I could never vote for Hillary, but she wasn't that. He played this by the book beautifully, brilliantly. He's a marketing genius. And this is why I don't think they're gonna resolve the trade issue with China. He needs an enemy. He needs somebody he can point to to say, those guys are bad, and if he resolves the issue, the enemy's gone away. He needs, he needs a scapegoat for the problems American has. He needs to be able to point Americans in the direction of who the bad guys are, and he can't succeed otherwise. So he has an incentive to keep this trade dispute going and say it's their fault they screwed it up. But you're simplifying it down to economics, but isn't it more about, if you listen to Bannon, about what kind of rules of the game you're gonna have for the world in the next 10, 20 years. Um, because China's supply chains, I was just in Turkey like a month ago. Yeah. Most of the goods in the local economy now are coming from China. So in the past, 10 years ago, why is that a problem? Well, no, well now they've got a vast return account deficit. When they devalue their currency, it just gets worse. Because now they've got to import. But the problem, with, so, the, but so, the so problem the with the Turkish economy yeah. is not that they're importing stuff from China. The problem with the Turkish economy is that policies, the Turkish government, the, the economic policies that the Turkish government has implemented inside Turkey. The current account deficit is just a consequence of, of the actual problems. It's not China's fault that Turkey has a problem. The supply chain that China's creating is to all our benefit. It's not a, it's not a threat because it's economics. If they, were, if they were marching tanks across the border into Turkey, okay, but that's not what they're doing, at least not yet. What they're doing is the trading. And if Turkey has problems, the reason Turkey saw a massive decline in the value of its currency has nothing to do with trade with China. It has everything to do with the fact that Erdogan used the Turkish Central Bank to print money to bribe his people into voting for him. And he's done that election after election, and he's, he's spiked up the Turkish economy by printing money. And yes, when you print money like that, some of it is gonna go to trade. And the, the currency declined because a lot, of the, a lot of the companies in Turkey had taken out uh, loans in dollars, spent it in uh, dinars, I guess, dinars, whatever the lira, lira. Uh, Turkish lira. And then when the currencies flipped, they, you know, when, when they printed money and there was inflation, there was hyperinflation in Turkey, they couldn't pay their debt back in dollars. That was the crisis. It has nothing to do with China. We can blame everything on China. It's an easy. But if you actually study the economics, this is the point. The reason the United States has problems is not because of China. The reason the United States has problems has nothing to do with illegal immigration. The reason the United States has problems has nothing to do with anybody outside the United States. The reason the United States has problems is because we elected FDR in the 1930s and then we elected a bunch of losers to the presidency who have slowly and systematically increased the role of the state and control and regulate and tax us to death. 
the reason the United States is in trouble is because of the United States, because Americans made bad decisions. And it's, 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 a, it's a fascist mentality to look for scapegoats out there to attribute your own problems with. You know, the reason Germany had hyperinflation had nothing to do with the Jews. It had everything to do with monetary policy that the German Central Bank engaged in. But it was easier to say it's their fault than to take responsibility for yourself. And to see that kind of, that kind of attitude in America is scary. Now, Aaron, um, Aaron, ideas. Ideas have consequences. Yes. The issue, and you raise SDR, um, to me, one of the most interesting things is that everyone praises FDR today, including Financial Times, The Economist, all of the people you would think beyond the right praise FDR. So you've got nobody who is advancing any ideas. Um, I mean, Henry Hazlitt wrote books describing why FDR's program was rubbish, and he was writing in the New Yorker. He actually had a prominent column New York in, Times. in New York Times in, in, in the 40s and 50s and 60s. We don't have anybody like that who is writing about these ideas that get read. So how do we get from the position we're in now, where we need these ideas disseminated, where you have a government controlled education system everywhere, where you could read PPE at Oxford and never hear the word libertarian or Mises, Right, so you'll end up in the in, in in the government in the UK never having heard about these ideas. Yeah. None of it is in the newspapers, even in what people regard as business newspapers. So if the ideas are not visible, other than at a Lion Rock dinner attended by 25 people, how do you start to bootstrap this? So this is where I think businesses can play a role without risking their reputations and everything else. And that is, I think what we need is to fund a massive educational effort around these ideas, finding those talented young people who are going to become the intellectuals of the future, who will become the Henry Hazlitts of the future. I think it's all about young people, it's all about education, and what businessmen have is the capital and the resources to be able to fund that. So I go to Oxford to expose them to ideas, I go to Eton, I go to, I go to high schools, I, you know, you've got to have a thousand memes going out there into the universities, into the schools, exposing people. Because at the end of the day, this is a battle of ideas. And mind you, the reason we're, I think we're in bad shape, and I think the reason we're in such bad shape is because the, the conservatives, the, the people who supposedly were for free markets in the past, completely capitulate. They completely capitulate. So even Margaret Thatcher at the end of the day couldn't hold it up because she had no base of support. The people underneath her uh, completely capitulated on every single important idea. And more important than anything is the, are the moral ideas. I mean, it's one thing, and this is, I think, where Henry Hazlitt didn't have even more impact, is because he was an economist. And he, you can do a lot as an economist. But what we need is more than economists. We need economists. We need ethicists and philosophers and political scientists and historians. You know, nobody knows the real history. Everybody thinks, I mean, one of the, one of the, the greatest century in all of human history, the greatest century in all of human history is the 19th century. The Industrial Revolution, for the first time in all of human history, changed human life. I don't know if you've seen the graph. You've seen the graph of income or wealth per capita from 100,000 years ago. It's basically flat. Nothing happens for 100,000 years. The whole of human history. I mean, we study all these periods in history, but nothing happened. You, you were born with X amount of stuff, and you died with exactly the same X amount of stuff if you were lucky. Your kids never made X plus one. They had X amount of stuff. Nothing changed for 100,000 years. And then suddenly, seemingly out of nowhere, it went like this. And you can't even measure it, how much it's gone up, because how do you measure the value of indoor plumbing? How do you measure the value of electricity? Not monetarily. It's enhanced all that. Life started for human beings in the 19th century. I mean, the Industrial Revolution changed everything. And yet, what do our kids know about the, about the Industrial Revolution? Child labor. What were children doing before the Industrial Revolution? They were working and dying on the farm. Most kids didn't make it to age 10. And they were certainly working 
right? Nobody got an education except a few aristocratic kids. Right? So they know child labor, they know pollution, they know slavery. Capitalism is the only system in human history to abolish slavery, right? 19th century is when slavery was abolished, both by the UK and then by the United States. And globally, for the most part, it was abolished during that period. I mean, everything important, women liberation, uh, real equality of rights, all happened during this century or immediately afterwards. And yet all we know about it are bad things, are, 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 are the horrific things. So history has to be retaught. All of these subjects need to be retaught, and unless we capture this intellectual high ground, unless we have people who can articulate that case, then we lose, because every time people think capitalism, they think of, of, of you know, slave labor. I, I just got somebody telling me that the only reason the West became rich was because it exploited the, um, the colonies, right, which is common but, in England. But exactly to your point, um, in Cambridge today, the vice, in our Cambridge in England, yeah. the vice chancellor is setting up a committee to investigate how the university should give compensation for how its history has damaged yes. the rest of the world because of the British colonial yes. system. Yes. So the only way they're thinking about this is let's look for damage and let's lash ourselves being so bad. <laughs> so uh, let me finish with this. So the, the question is that, you, and, and um, of course Scruton has come out recently and said the only thing you can do is actually abolish all universities. Sure. And, all, start, all, and start new ones. And all businesses, because because yeah. the capital probably originated from some slave trader, you yeah. know, two hundred years ago or something. I mean, you have to abolish everything. So, you should, you start, so should we be starting new educational institutions? Because the existing ones are done. Well, well let me let, let me just relate to this. You say something about this this Cambridge stuff and this. This is a direct consequence. I mean, Ayn Rand talks about this. She talked about this fifty years ago, and she she nailed it. Like she often did so many things. This is a direct consequence of the morality of altruism, the morality that says that somebody else's need is a direct moral claim against you. You are morally obliged to take care of the need. Because then it becomes a competition of who is more needy. It becomes a competition of who has had the most injustices caused upon him. It's a competition about then, in order to virtue signal, in order to capture the moral hunger, who can you know, flagellate themselves the more because they have sinned the more. And, and what we're seeing now, the whole intersectionality that the left has where you have these uh, different levels of oppression and who's more oppressed and who's less oppressed. And of course, we white guys, are, I'm a little, I'm Jewish, I guess. Uh, so I get a little bit of, 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 uh, of uh, penance, of, of a little bit of marks, but if, if I was white and not Jewish, then God, I'm, I'm the most evil creature ever. And oh! Oh, it's in everybody, everybody else in the world, because they uh, they uh, are by definition oppressed. But it's it's the elevation of the oppressed. That's what morality is about. Morality is about worshiping the need of others. Unless we reverse that moral thinking, that 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 approach to, to morality, we can't win. Right? Don't, we can't don't you win. sense that there is a pushback? And I, I sense there's a sort of. I, I think, but the pushback is not a moral pushback. I don't see a moral pushback, and the pushback is coming from the wrong direction. It's you know, if you think Jordan Peterson is pushback, right? I don't know if you know who Jordan Peterson is. But I don't think it's pushback. I think Jordan Peterson, at the end of the day, buys into it, line, hook, and sinker. He just is a conservative altruist, but you know he wants to he wants this to happen a little slower. No, but he but took he, a moral stand. They but get, it's not a moral get, stand because he, he like denies moral. he denies the opposite of the altruism. He isn't standing up for self-interest because he actually has a whole video saying there's no such thing as self-interest. And self-interest, if there was such a thing, it would be bad and evil. So he is a conservative altruist. He wants things to go a little slower. Um, no, I, I think, think he's also postmodern, and there's a lot of problems with Jordan Peterson. But, but the point is, I don't think there is a backlash. Not a real backlash. Not a philosophical backlash. And if there is good, you know, then then hooray. Then, no, no, no then I think it's an important part of it. I, I mean, I'm trying. You're, yeah, you're at the you're at the forefront. <laughs> but should we establish new educational institutions? Yes, and I think there's a real opportunity because because the the flip side of all the negativity is, we have for the first time in human history a tool that allows us to propagate ideas at the speed of light. Um, we have the internet, and, and, and I, I, I think we underestimate the power of this tool. I can put up a video on YouTube 
uh, and it can be watched all over the world at any time at a marginal cost to me and to the viewer of zero, zero. Um, so to me, one of the ways in which people can get educated is through the internet rather than through actual institutions and establishments. And I think, I think we need to create more content. I think we need to put content up, use the internet, get better at internet marketing, get better at getting our ideas out there to young people through this amazing, you know, amazing tool that we have. The costs are very low. But I, I do think that what we need to focus our efforts on is education, is getting young people, is getting them exposed to these ideas. And then once they're exposed to the ideas, then look, everything's on the internet. They, they, can, they can read anything, they can find any video, they can educate themselves. They are good historians, and some of that history is on the internet. So in every one of these, you don't need the numbers that you used to need in order to re-educate the population. I mean, the bad guys know this really, really well, so we need to learn the same thing. You can just use, but you need to use digital marketing. You need to be able to get the word out there. One of the reasons I travel and do this around the world is to try, it, not because I think I convince anybody in a talk, but hopefully I stimulate enough of them to think about it that they go and they Google, right? They go search Ayn Rand, or they go search YouTube, or they go, they go search for the ideas. The ideas are out there now. In the past, we'd have to lug books around now, I mean, there are no excuses in my view today because of this well, amazing tool. This is so I want to bring it to a close at this point so that Yara can sit down and, and recover. <laughs> <laughs> but th this is a perfect ending because this is a message to the Live Art Institute in Hong Kong, right? And it's what we've been saying to ourselves is that the way in which we reach people, we need to look at technology, we need to look at faster ways of reaching people, not writing boring articles like I write, but actually getting to people directly. And what we're trying to do, of course, is get to students before their, their brains have solidified into a particular position and, and give them some ideas and different ways of looking at things in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong's small enough yeah. that if you reach, I don't know, 20 students a year consistently, yeah, over a period of time, you do could have an effect. Particularly if they're the right students and the smart. And let me say something in favor of boring articles. You have to have the boring articles because once they consume the the candy you've put out there, they need to get some real content. Yeah. They need to get some real meat, right? So you want to you want to you want to catch them with the with the with the uh, you know passionate Iran book speech out there. But then they need to get to be able to read something that is that they can sink their teeth into. So you need everything. And and the internet, there's no reason not to have everything. You can have you you can link to. You know, Adam Smith, right? You can link to Ayn Rand. You can link to any of these sources now that are just available out there. And you can, so we think of it in terms of, you know, we have a funnel. We have a lot of, you know, stuff here to attract people. Yeah. And then we have medium stuff if they want to learn more. And if they really want more, then there's this real hardcore stuff down here. And we know that only a few people will get to this hardcore stuff. But if they're the right people, they're the people who can change the world.